Well, I wonder um, if you've ever had a situation where you thought you knew someone and then you ended up being wrong about them. Maybe it was someone you thought was your friend and then you found out later on that that person was talking behind your back or they were nice to your face but then they were really trying to come against you in some way. Or maybe the opposite, maybe there was somebody you thought was against you, someone you thought was your enemy in some sense, but then you found out later that wasn't true at all, that you'd completely misjudged them, that actually they were someone who was your friend. Well, to give an example of what I mean, just from cinema, someone tell me who this is and what movie he's from. Who is this? Well, first off, what movie is this from? Star Wars. Star Wars, okay. Now, this guy, what's his name? Palpatine. Palpatine. <laughs> now, now, I'd probably call him many things. Now, in the first three movies, do people think he's good or bad? They think he's good. He's called the Supreme Chancellor. He's kind of the head of the whole Senate thing, the power structure. And all the good guys think that he's on their side. He thinks he's working their side of the street. You know, they trust him. But then it ends up that he's this guy. That's like the worst yearbook picture ever. <laughs> he becomes the emperor. He's the ultimate bad guy. But, and he was a bad guy the whole time. But he just had everybody tricked. They, they thought he was good, but he wasn't. He was actually not their friend. He was working against them the whole time. They completely misjudged him. Well, how about this character? What movie is he from? Harry Potter, Harry Potter right? We got any Harry Potter fans? This is from the third movie, or third book, The Prisoner of Azkaban. What's his name? Sirius Black. Black. Now, throughout the entire book or the movie, they think Sirius Black is a murderous madman. And the main character, Harry, has to always be looking over his shoulder, you know, maybe he's out to get him, and you always have to be on the lookout because he's right around the corner, and if he gets you, he, you're done for because he's so murderously evil. But then once you find out in the end of the book, or the end of the movie, that's not true. He's actually the main character's godfather, really cares for him, loves him, completely mischaracterized. In fact, Harry, the main character, had been getting gifts throughout the book and found out that it was actually this murderous, evil man giving him these good gifts because he wasn't. He was on his side the whole time. And in both senses, or in both those senses, those characters were misjudged. The assumptions about them were wrong. Either that they were good, but then they weren't, or they were bad, but then they weren't. So what we're going to explore this morning together is what about God? What about God? Is God for us? Does God seem like he's our friend and then he's not? Or is God not our friend, but he is? Is there something about God that we've gotten wrong? And that's what we're going to explore. And our text this morning is from John 3. And you can remain seated because we've been standing a lot this morning, and I'll read it to you. It's John 3, 16 through John 19. Some of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. And it says there that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of the Scriptures, the authority of the Bible. We thank you for its story. Lord, I pray this morning as we spend time examining it, that you would examine us and that your Holy Spirit would bring the text to life in our life. Not that we understand it simply, but that we would be transformed by it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to ask some questions about God. We're going to ask some questions. Do we have God right or do we have God wrong? And uh, one strategy that 
some people can take if you have a question about somebody is to pull out a daisy and to ask questions based on a daisy by pulling its petals. And what do you say when you pull its petal? He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. And that is a question we're going to ask this morning of God. Does God love you? Or does God love you not? Well, it seems from our text that God does love you. John 3.16 simply says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But is it quite so simple? Sometimes the way the story of the Bible is presented, it sounds a little different. Maybe something like this. All humans have sinned, causing God to be angry and to want to kill them and to burn them forever in hell. But Jesus somehow got in the way. He took the punishment instead. It helped, of course, that he's innocent and that he's God's own son. So we're in the clear after all. We're headed for heaven instead, provided, of course, that you believe it. Does this resonate? Has anyone heard this gospel? This is the gospel of the angry father. I don't know how many of you grew up with angry fathers. And the angry father needs to take out his anger. Somebody needs to get hurt. And so Jesus is like the child that gets in the way of the angry father. No, dad, no, dad, no, dad. Don't hurt them, don't hurt them. Hurt me instead. Hit me. Kill me. Won't that make you happy, Dad, to kill me so you don't have to kill them? In this view, God hates sinners so much. He's determined to punish them, but Jesus more or less happens to get in the way and take the death blow on our behalf so that we're somehow spared. In fact, we might put it this way. Maybe John 3.16 should be said like this. God so hated the world that he killed his only son. Is that the text? Is that what you think about God, the Father? The Father hates you. Well, the Bible is pretty clear. And not just in the New Testament, by the way, but from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, that this is not the right story. To quote from Deuteronomy 7, again, to show that the Old Testament is not this Old Testament God of wrath that just can't wait to get his hands on you, but good thing Jesus came in, took the death blow, and now he's somehow some kind of a different God. In Deuteronomy 7, it says, The Lord did not set his heart on you or choose you because you are more numerous than the other nations, for you are the smallest. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. It was simply that the Lord loves you. Did the Israelites have to do anything to earn the love of God? You can answer. No. Think about it like this. If you're a parent, particularly, but if you're not a parent, if you don't have children, imagine your love for your parents for a second. But particularly for parents, when you had your first child, did that child have to do anything to cause you to love him or her? Did you have to kind of give it a few weeks to decide? <laughs> Maybe you did. <laughs> the child simply has to exist. The child simply has to be born. Once the child is born, the parent just loves the child. And not just a little bit. The, child, the parent is completely in love with the child just because he or she was born. And then you have one child, then you think, could I ever love another one as much as I love this one? Right? You ever have that thought? And what happens when you have your second child? Do you love that child just as much? And what did that child have to do to earn it? Zero. 
And if you don't have children, think about the love you have for your parents. You just have it. It's just there. That is the love that God has for you. You don't have to do anything. You just have to be. Because God is love. And in that sense, the cross did not change God's mind about you. The Father did not look at Jesus on the cross and suddenly have a change of heart. The purpose of the atonement was not to bring about a change in God's attitude towards us. God's attitude has always and ever been the same. Judgment, which is real, against sin is preceded, accompanied, and followed by God's mercy. For parents, and again, you can think about if you don't have children, just the love that you have for someone. If your child needed something, would you withhold it from them? What if your child was in trouble? Would you, do so, would you intervene and help them if your child was in trouble? The Bible says that God loved us so much, that God's love for us was so vast and was such an extreme that he was willing to die for us. The Bible says that God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and for me. And in that sense, we don't have to say that Jesus saves us from God. Jesus does not save us from God. Jesus saves us to God. Jesus brings us back into relationship with God because we were separated from God because of our sin. We were the ones estranged from him, and he's come, he's saved us. He's entered in, and he's given his life, he's shed his blood to cleanse us and to bring us back into relationship with God because his love for us has been from beginning to middle and to end. He doesn't stop. God loves you. You don't have to ask that question. But maybe we should ask a different question. Maybe we should pull back out the flower. Instead of asking whether or not God loves us, maybe we should ask the question, is God condemning us? Does he condemn me? Or does he condemn me not? Is God condemning us? Or is God condemning us not? And to show what I'm meaning by that or what the Bible means, just put it in its starkest possible terms. And you can count on this man to do this. His name is Christopher Hitchens, the late atheist. What does it mean to say that God would be condemning us? And here's a quote from Christopher Hitchens. He says, religion, or we could just say Christianity in his sense, is a totalitarian belief. It is the desire that there be an unalterable, unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you're asleep, who can subject you to total surveillance around the clock every waking and sleeping minute of your life before you're born and even worse and where the real fun begins after you're dead. A real celestial North Korea. Again, you can always count on Christopher Hitchens to put it in the starkest terms. In other words, is God just like a real malevolent elf on a shelf? You know that little, you know what you put out on Christmas time to keep watch on your children so that they behave because that little elf is watching and he's keeping track and he's going to let, you know, Santa know what's going on. Is that what God is like? Is God like watching over you to watch you screw up? He can't wait for you to mess up because he's just tallying this whole thing up. And when he gets a hold of you, you better watch out because he's really on top of what you're doing. Is he just got you under his thumb? Well, our text seems to say no. John 3, 17 and 18 says, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So what do we mean by saying God's not condemning us, but we're condemned already? Particularly, what does it mean to say we're condemned already? In order to understand what the Bible means by saying you are condemned already, 
is to understand the nature and the power and the result of sin. Sin. And part of our issue in our culture, and maybe for you, maybe for me, is sin is not something we take too seriously sometimes. Or if it is something we take seriously, we think, well, yeah, my neighbor's pretty bad, but not me. <coughs> to kind of illustrate that, whoever, who raised you up reading uh, Calvin and Hobbes? You know Calvin and Hobbes, the comic strip? Well, here's what Calvin and Hobbes might say about that. This is Calvin and Hobbes talking about Christmas, speaking about Elf on a Shelf, and he says, I'm getting nervous about Christmas. And Hobbes says, well, you're worried you haven't been good? Calvin says, well, that's just the question. It's all relative, right? I mean, what's Santa's definition? How good do you have to be to qualify as good? I haven't killed anybody. I mean, that's good, right? I haven't committed any felonies. I haven't started any wars. I mean, wouldn't you say that's pretty good? Wouldn't you say I should get lots of presents? Hobbes says, well, maybe good is more than the absence of bad. Calvin says, see, that's what worries me. Isn't there this sense sometimes we're like, well, yeah, I know there's sin in the world, but really, it's not really me. I mean, but there's this underlying sense of like, but yeah, but something's wrong. Yeah, but something's wrong. Even I recognize, if you're honest, there's something wrong in your heart. You, even if it's under the surface, you recognize that. Paul Rucker says, if guilt is defined only as a feeling of unworthiness, then obviously only a minority would qualify. But sin includes the real situation of all human beings before God, whether they know it or not. Sin is something that you're swimming in. It's the water you're in, whether you know it or not. And that sin is self-condemning. It's self-condemning. Because the Bible understands sin as, one, something that you do, but also a power that you are under. Galatians says that a man reaps what he sows. Those who live only to satisfy their sinful desires will harvest decay and death. The Bible understands that your sinful actions, the lying, the, the covetousness, the thoughts, the lust, all this stuff is like sowing seeds. And it says it's sowing seeds that will eventually come to harvest, that will harvest decay and death and pain. But Jesus says that sin is not simply something you do, it's also a power that you're under. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to it. It's not just something that you do. It is something you do, but you're enslaved to it as well. It's a power that you are under its dominion. The Apostle Paul says, don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether or not you are slave to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. In other words, there's two parts here. One, you must offer yourselves up to something. And that offering yourself up is something that you do. It's an action. You're complicit. You're responsible. But it's also a power because whatever it is you offer yourself up to, you're a slave to it. You're a slave. And the Bible says that those who are in sin are slaves to it. A short illustration of what I mean, if it's not clear already. A friend of mine from New York, his friend, uh, his name is Jose. I didn't ask him permission to tell this story, so don't tell him I told you. <laughs> Jose is a good man. He's a good man. But early in his life, he'd be the first to admit his life was not very righteous. Coming out of his teenage years into his early 20s, he got involved with different kind of crime activities. He would, uh, I don't know if there was courier or something, but he'd have guns and weapons and drugs in the trunk of his car, and he'd deliver at certain places. He, he worked for crime. He got involved in drugs, and that to an extreme, to the point where he was living in an abandoned house with other people, just strung out. That's all he just was strung out. And his life was quickly coming to an end. It was a downward spiral to the extreme. So one day he's in this house, he's strung out, and he hears a knock at the door. And he gets up to answer the door, and who do you think it was? His mom. Now here's a question for you. What good would it do for his mother to start condemning him at that point? 
What good would that do? Can't you see? He's condemned already. He's already condemned. It wouldn't do any good for the mother to start condemning him. And that's like God meeting you and I in our sin. God doesn't have to condemn us. We are already condemned. Sin is what leads to pain and decay and death. We're already swimming in it. We're already complicit in it. We're already under its power and under its dominion. God doesn't have to condemn us, and he doesn't. We're already condemned. That's what it's saying. You're already condemned. But Jose, my friend, could not save himself. The power of sin over his life was such that he wasn't going to save himself from the situation. He needed his mom to come and to pull him out of the situation he was in to save and deliver him because that's what we need when we are under a power that we are enslaved to what we need is redemption we need liberation and you and I can't save ourselves from this we can't save ourselves from what we're complicit in we can't save ourselves from this power that we are under we need someone to come from the outside to save us we need someone who's not going to come and condemn us and rub our faces in it what good is that Someone who's going to meet us at the door of our lives. And when we open up the door, we see Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm here to save you. And my friend Jose was saved, and now he's a pastor. His life is transformed. So the question is not whether or not God loves you or not. He's demonstrated his love for you. That while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. He gave his blood to cleanse you. He loves you that much. And he's not here condemning you. He's not here to condemn you. He's here to save you. So the real question this morning for you and for me is not whether or not God loves us. The real question is not whether or not God is condemning us. The real question, and this is a real question, is whether or not you love him or do you love him not. That is the real question. John 3.19 says, this is the verdict. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love darkness rather than light because their works and their deeds were evil. So John 3.16 opens up by saying God loves the world. God is loving. God has been the love of the world from the beginning to the end. But then it ends by saying, but people love darkness. You see, all of us, myself too, have something in our lives to which our heart belongs. There is something, someone, to which my heart belongs, and it's true of you. There is something in your life that your heart belongs to. The question is, what is it? And what the Bible teaches is in that unless your heart belongs to God, then whatever it is that your heart belongs to is leading towards death. Why? Because God is the source of life. Think about it like this. I have a laptop computer here. It's plugged in. If I unplug this computer, will it die immediately? No. Why? Because it has a battery in it. And depending on how old the computer is and depending how nice it is, the battery lasts longer than other computers. But the point is, once I unplug it, that computer is headed towards death. It's just a matter of time before that computer dies. And that computer will die forever unless I plug it back in. And that is true of you. It's true of you and it's true of me. Unless my life is plugged back into the source of life, we are all headed to death forever. The Bible calls it eternal death. Jesus says, unless You want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it if you gain the whole world and lose or forfeit your very self? Jesus is saying, yeah, you can give your heart to these other things, but you're going to lose everything because that's not life. You were never meant to draw life from these places. And as as, as you're trying to draw life from anything other than God, you're like an unplugged computer. Your life will last for a while, but it's going out, and it's going to go out forever. Unless you lose this and plug yourself in, to use that phrase, to the true source of life, which is God 
through the love of Jesus Christ for you and his death and resurrection on the cross, your death will be forever. He is the only source of life, the only one. A final illustration, and then we'll close. Forgive me if this is an illustration you've heard before. Imagine that we're all at Niagara Falls, and it's a lot warmer than it is today, so we're comfortable. And as you're looking at the falls, you see a man walking across on a tightrope. Would you be impressed? I would be. He comes all the way across. Now you're really impressed. And then the man grabs a wheelbarrow and puts it full of dirt, and he pushes the wheelbarrow across this tightrope on Niagara Falls. Now are you impressed? Yeah, I bet you would be. But then the man comes up to you and he says, now get in the wheelbarrow and I'm pushing you across. <laughs> the question this morning, have you gotten in the wheelbarrow or not? We can all look at Jesus, just like this man on a tightrope, and applaud what he's done. We can all clap for him as he comes across. We can all be impressed by him. He's not interested in your applause. He's interested in your heart. He's interested in your life. He's saying, get in the wheelbarrow. Because unless you get in the wheelbarrow, the Bible says you have no part with him. And if there was some point in your life where you prayed a prayer, and you thought that was good enough, and you try your best to be a nice person, and you think, I'll go to church every once in a while, and you're impressed with Jesus. Jesus says, you have no part with me. God's not interested in your applause. He's interested in your very self. And the question for you this morning, have you gotten in the wheelbarrow? Have you surrendered your life to the king? Is he belong to you, and do you belong to him? Because other than that, your life is unplugged. Your computer is going out, and you will die, and you will die forever. And that is it. But Jesus has entered in. He has demonstrated his love for you. He is not condemning you. You're already unplugged. He doesn't have to condemn you. You're all, your life is draining. He doesn't have to condemn you. He's here to save you. And he's saying, get in the wheelbarrow, get in the wheelbarrow, get in the wheelbarrow. It's the only way for you to live. It's the only way you'll have life everlasting. Have you gotten in? Or are you just applauding, thinking that's good enough? And maybe today's a day for you that you've already gotten in, and you need to be reminded afresh of what God has done for you. You need to be reminded that God doesn't hate you. God loves you. He always has, and he always will. Or maybe you need to be reminded God's not condemning you. He's not waiting for you to screw up. He's your friend to come alongside you, to journey with you through life. But most important, if you've never gotten in the wheelbarrow, if you've never surrendered yourself to Jesus, let today be the day that you say, Jesus, I belong to you. I will turn from what my heart used to belong to, and I will give it completely to you. And when you do that, you will find true, everlasting life. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the only true source of life. And you have come to give it to us. You died that we might have it. You're not here to condemn us. You're here to save us. And Lord, I pray that for some that need to be reminded of that anew, that we would walk out of these doors encouraged and invigorated for who you are for us. And Lord, if there are any here that need to get into the wheelbarrow and to be a pushed across to life anew, would you let today be that day? Would you let your Holy Spirit, and would you cause your Holy Spirit to cause them to come to newness of life and let that life be everlasting life. 
And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.